Lakotas. This is our land. The men died for the women and the women raised our children. Now's the time to resist. If none of us are brave enough, we're all gonna die. Stand up and resist. Hale um boki he on lapi oyate le nach on pekele na on kapie na le makot chum ki tra pekele na on ki chimpi tako on ki tra pekele na hekta ke la khota ki on ki chimpi chawo ki he on ichi lapi We are the matriarchal Tichuan Lakota Oyate of the Osheti Chacoan, an indigenous First Nation people of Turtle Island, the continent known as North America. In togetherness with our buffalo relatives, the Tatanka Oyate, we once roamed freely across the vast prairies and hills of the Northern Great Plains until the occupation of these lands by the expanding United States Empire. Born over thousands of years, our sacred way of life taught us to live, love, and thrive, qualities that endure in our survival today. As we move beyond seven generations in our unyielding struggle to resist genocide, our matriarchal grandmothers are taking back their strength once again. In togetherness with Lakota warriors and people, we speak out for accountability and change to end the atrocities that keep us from healing our nation. Only by understanding our story can our people live free once again. To our relatives from the four directions, we ask you to listen, not only with your ears, but with your hearts. From the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the place you know as South Dakota, this is our story. We did not ask you, white men, to come here. We do not want your civilization. We would live as our fathers did, and their fathers before them. In 1492, the indigenous Arawak people of the Caribbean islands encountered Christopher Columbus of Spain. Columbus wrote in his log, They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus proceeded to unleash a reign of terror unlike anything seen before. When he was finished, 8 million Arawaks, virtually the entire native population of Hispanolia, had been exterminated by torture, murder, forced labor, starvation, disease, and despair. Columbus's atrocities with cross and sword were justified by the Christian doctrine of divine discovery and set religious and legal precedent for the invasion and genocide of America's indigenous peoples for the next 500 years and beyond. By 1650, a precarious relationship between the First Nations of the East Coast of North America and New England colonists was collapsing into slaughter and enslavement of native people by settlers who wanted more land and wealth. We find that most of the English colonies sanctioned and encouraged scalping Indians. In 1776, the United States birthed the first 13 states on land taken through the ethnic cleansing of dozens of eastern seaboard tribes. The Declaration of Independence further enshrined the belief of Euro-American settler supremacy by declaring native peoples to be merciless Indian savages. In 1787, the United States adopted its constitution. Article 6 established treaties as the supreme law of the land. Despite this supreme law, treaties with sovereign native nations became slippery promises, easily broken when convenient. In 1823, in the case of Johnson and Graham Lessie v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the First Nation people's right of occupancy was subordinate to the United States' divine right of discovery. 
The United States has unequivocally agreed that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy. This landmark ruling provided legal cover for governmental policies that would claim white Euro-Christian supremacy as justification for stealing indigenous lands and for the genocide of native peoples. In 1849, the California Gold Rush triggered the mass Western migration of settlers, putting them in direct conflict with existing indigenous nations. In 1851, anxious to protect white settlers on their way to California and to avoid a full-scale war with the Lakota and our allies, the United States requested the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux and other Northern Great Plains nations. Six Sioux men signed the treaty which recognized the Lakota nation's sovereignty over a vast territory amounting to approximately 5% of the continental United States. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, the United States sent its war-hardened soldiers on a crusade to settle the West. Led by the growing dogma of manifest destiny, the U.S. claimed the God-given right to expand its borders from sea to shiny sea. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. In 1868, unable to defeat the warriors of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations fighting to protect our lands and people, for the first time in its history, the United States appealed for peace and drafted the second Treaty of Fort Laramie. The treaty established the Great Sioux Reservation, including the Black Hills and unceded Indian Territory, to be set apart for the absolute and undisturbed use and occupation of the Indians, and that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the Indian Territory. Unable to defeat our free Lakota people with military might, the U.S. government increased the use of deceptive practices to subvert our matriarchal system and to create the appearance of agreement when our lands and rights were stolen. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromise can be made. Just three years later, in 1871, the U.S. government ceased to recognize Indian nations as sovereign and independent with the passage of the Indian Appropriation Act. This legislation legalized the theft of our treaty-protected lands and further threatened our way of life with our buffalo relatives. The civilization of the Indians is impossible while the buffalo remain upon the plains. The mass slaughter of our buffalo relatives, the Tatanko Ayate, lasted from 1871 until 1910. In just the first seven years, buffalo hunters decimated the great herds of buffalo nearly to extinction. The U.S. Army encouraged the slaughter by providing free ammunition and supplies. In 1873 alone, buffalo hunters massacred more than 1.5 million buffalo. As planned, our people became increasingly dependent on the U.S. government for even the most basic of human needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. In 1874, after illegally trespassing on Lakota territory, General George Custer publicly announced the discovery of gold in the Pahasapa, the Black Hills. As intended, the announcement unleashed a flood of miners and prospectors into the Great Sioux Reservation in violation of the 1868 treaty. In 1875, the U.S. demanded we sell the entire Black Hills region. We refused. The U.S. declared this an act of war and launched a massive invasion of our lands to annihilate our people. Nothing short of their annihilation will get the Black Hills from them. On the 25th of June, 1876, in the Battle of the Greasy Grass, or Little Bighorn, the Sioux Nation, along with our Cheyenne and Arapaho relatives, won a great victory over General Custer and the elite 7th Cavalry. On that day, we defeated the might of the U.S. Army and took their flag. 
Seeking revenge for their defeat, the U.S. Army directed Colonel Ronald McKenzie to unleash total war. U.S. forces went from village to village, killing women, children, and ponies, and destroying teepees, clothing, blankets, and food supplies. The U.S. then launched a sell or starve policy and withheld rations to coerce our people to sell the Black Hills and to relinquish our sovereign rights. These inhuman atrocities forced the surrender of many Lakota people to the U.S. agencies by spring of 1877. Despite being on the brink of starvation, few of our people signed the agreement to cede the Black Hills. When the paper was signed by Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others to give up the Black Hills, the majority of the Indians of the Teton Sioux tribe were not there, and they never consented to giving up the Black Hills, and never gave those chiefs permission or authority to sell or give up the Black Hills. Unable to obtain the required three-fourths consent, the U.S. seized the Black Hills with an act of Congress, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Incensed by the illegal seizure, negotiator for the U.S. Henry Benjamin Whipple wrote, I know of no other instance in history where a great nation has so shamefully violated its oath. Our country must forever bear the disgrace and suffer the retribution of its wrongdoings. Our children's children will tell the sad story in hushed tones and wonder how their fathers dared so to trample on justice and trifle with God. After breaking treaties, seizing native lands, and destroying our system of life, the U.S. government introduced another element of the genocide of Turtle Island's indigenous people, assimilation. Kill the Indian, save the man. In the 1880s, the U.S. government joined forces with Christian and Catholic missionaries to steal native children, as young as two years old, from their families ship them to schools far away, burn their clothes, and cut their hair, deprive them of loving family contact for years, and use mental and physical abuse to force their assimilation into American society and the Christian religion. There are but two goals for the Indians, civilization or annihilation. In 1883, the U.S. created the Code of Indian Offenses to criminalize our culture and spiritual practices such as the Sundance, the Giveaway, Gifts for the Bride, Feasts, and Medicine Men. Punishments included fines, hard labor, imprisonment, and withheld rations. In 1885, the U.S. Congress continued its assault on tribal sovereignty by passing the Major Crimes Act which unilaterally extended U.S. jurisdiction over major crimes into sovereign Lakota territory. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of our Mother Earth. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say I instead of we, and this is mine instead of this is ours. Two years later in 1889, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the U.S. Congress passed an act to divide the Great Sioux Reservation into five separate and smaller reservations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation. The U.S. government opened the remaining 11 million acres of Sioux Treaty territory for public purchase, including sacred sites and burial grounds our people used for thousands of years. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, followed up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. By 1890, our Lakota people, once powerful and free, were entirely dependent on the U.S. government. The U.S. had forcibly removed our people from our homeland, confined them to reservations, cut their rations by half, stolen our children, and decimated the great herds of our buffalo relatives. On the 29th of December, 500 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment surrounded Bigfoot's band of about 350 Lakota people at Wounded Knee Creek, 
and along with four rapid-fire Gatling guns, massacred 312 of our men, women, and children. Our people know Wounded Knee as a massacre. The U.S. government calls it a battle. 23 U.S. troops were awarded the Medal of Honor. Something else died here in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dreams died here. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. In 1903, the U.S. Supreme Court decision Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock secured U.S. hedge money over indigenous peoples by granting Congress unlimited authority to break Indian treaties unilaterally to sell treaty-protected land and to regulate all aspects of Indian affairs without the consent of indigenous nations. In 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA. In a misguided attempt to fix the indigenous nations the U.S. deliberately had broken. Despite opposition from traditional elders and in violation of the 1868 treaty, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and Harold Ix, Secretary of Interior, illegally approved the IRA Oglala Sioux Tribal Council and Constitution for the Pine Ridge Reservation with the support of only 1,348 tribal members out of an estimated 12,000 Oglala Lakota people. Most of our people were ineligible, unable, or unwilling to cast a vote. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. Indian Health Services, IHS, physicians performed involuntary sterilizations on thousands of Lakota women aged 15 to 44. IHS facilities singled out full-blood Lakota women for sterilization procedures. On the 27th of February, 1973, 300 American Indian movement activists from more than 75 tribes began occupying Wounded Knee, the site of the massacre 83 years earlier. Traditional elders from Pine Ridge sought to exercise our people's natural right to sovereignty and to take a stand against the corruption of the illegal Oglala Sioux tribe government. Continuing the 150-year war on the Lakota people, federal authorities escalated the occupation of Wounded Knee into armed conflict with the force of U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, National Guard personnel, armored personnel carriers mounted with machine guns, snipers and helicopters, semi and fully automatic assault rifles, grenade launchers, tear gas, jets for aerial photographs, and paramilitary personnel. The occupation ended after 71 days when a local Lakota man was killed by a federal sniper and both sides agreed to disarm. From 1973 to 1976, in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee takeover, the U.S. government backed Oglala Sioux Tribe President Dick Wilson and his guardians of our Oglala Nation paramilitary vigilante force, nicknamed Goons, inflicted the reign of terror on Pine Ridge. More than 60 grassroots activists, traditional full-blood Lakota people, and our supporters were assassinated. 300 were harassed and beaten, 562 were arrested, of which only 15 were convicted of crimes. During that time, the murder rate on the Pine Ridge Reservation soared to 170 per 100,000, the highest in the world at that time. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the 1877 seizure of the Black Hills was illegal, but did not return the land to our people, offering money instead. To this day, we refuse to accept the monetary compensation offered for the theft of sacred Bahasapa. In 2000, 
at a ceremony acknowledging the 175th anniversary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Assistant Secretary of the BIA, Kevin Gover, admitted. From the very beginning, the Office of Indian Affairs was an instrument by which the United States enforced its ambition against the Indian nations and the Indian people who stood in its path. It must be acknowledged that the deliberate spread of disease, the decimation of the mighty bison herds, the use of the poison alcohol to destroy mind and body, and the cowardly killing of women and children made for tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of the clash of competing ways of life. Though he described the multitude of ways the U.S. government has devastated indigenous peoples and nations, he failed to admit the truth. Genocidal warfare continues today. The genocide of the Lakota people is not just a tragedy of the past, nor is it fiction depicted by the vanishing Indian or noble savage, so common in movies, television, and in popular culture. In truth, genocidal actions continue to be inflicted upon the Lakota every day, compounding the historical trauma of mass murder, boarding school abuse, and enforced poverty that has passed from one generation of our people to the next. The inhumanity continues because the founding belief of American culture supremacy has never been challenged. Ongoing atrocities are felt most profoundly through the lives and experiences of our elders, the warriors who protect them, and other traditional and grassroots Lakota Oyate who struggle against a corrupt system put in place by the U.S. government. To speak out within this system is an extraordinary act of courage. The price of courage is retaliation. The United States classifies Lakota freedom fighters as domestic terrorists. We suffer abuse, neglect, and withholding of food, housing, and other services necessary for our well-being, even physical assault, imprisonment on false charges, and assassination. It is with great love for our people that we tell our story despite the cost. We draw upon the strength of our ancestors to create a future for our children and grandchildren. Just as our ancestors refused to sign away our sovereign land and rights under conditions of starvation and abuse, we resist the slow, silent form of genocide inflicted upon us today. We were a matriarchy. We are a matriarchy. The matriarchal system was created by three women, three matriarchal grandmas, one that was miserable one that understood the balance of love and the other one that gave the men the direction to be who they are to protect the nation which the four nations came out with the four heads men do you see the three grandmothers in between the said old men so you got one two three four five six and seven the three grandmothers are in there see that's why we're known as the ocheti shakoi but the Teton nation itself, Tetua, was these three grandmothers, the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota. See, the matriarchal system was a powerful way of governing itself, where women told us men what to do. We don't do that no more because we're living a patriarchal lifestyle. Many of us think that by 1868, when the last treaty was made, that by then that those soldiers had realized that Mm -mm. we got to keep these women out of here. And so it was just the Article 12, three-fourths of the adult males could only change it. To subvert Lakota sovereignty and our cultural system of matriarchal leadership, the U.S. illegally forced its patriarchal form of government upon our people, called the Oglala Sioux Tribe, OST, administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA. This cultural genocide started way back in the late 1800s. It started with, um, even with the negotiations for the treaty. It was starting then by, by the American government making paper chiefs, you know, picking out a man that they could give whiskey to or money to, and then he would do whatever they wanted. The people that presented those treaties say, use our sovereign nations. You are a nation unto yourselves. 
You have the right to rule yourselves. Yet, they change it because it satisfies them. The Major Crimes Act. That, to me, was the last uh, <clears throat> federal law, and it's a federal law, that took away the whole, um, really, government structure of the Tichuan people. Because what that did was it forbade us to use our own laws. Because we were, quote, primitive savages, then the federal government took it upon themselves to impose this law and in essence take away all of our own enforcement rights ourselves. So by our not being able to enforce our own laws, then you have really a really destruction of people. Founded on corrupt values of the U.S. political system, the Oglala Sioux Tribe is easily manipulated by the U.S. policy goals, yet shielded from oversight by its sovereign status. OST officials are able to pass blame and responsibility back and forth with the BIA for the devastating socio-economic conditions this system creates. The IOA Tribal Council government process is a federal funded program. It is not a government. The tribe and Washington, D.C. is in serious violation of human civil rights violation. They broke every inch of our rights and nothing, nobody's doing anything about it. Even our own tribal government since 1934 to 2012, they're in serious violations of human and civil rights. Not doing nothing, nobody. My advice to the people today to ask me about the IRA process is throw the whole system out the door. Lakota grandmothers are the traditional matriarchal leaders of the Lakota nation and are the key to a renewal of political and cultural sovereignty for the Lakota Oyate. Women are for survival. They're always for the survival of all the people. And so they have to look further and they have to look broader and they have to see, okay, what's going to happen if we do this or we need that or, you know. So, in our prophecies it said that during these last days, where, which we are in now, that then the women would start coming forward again. Every treaty has nothing but males on it, don't it, brother? And not once do you see a woman's signature in there. Do you know why? Because the women are the only ones still free. If our men know who they are, they will ask our opinion. <laughs> they will ask direction and guidance from the women. Our elders are the customary leaders who administer full sovereignty and keep traditional language, culture, and wisdom alive within our people. They are the heart of our nation. They are actually the backbone of our, uh, the nation. They basically carry the language, the culture, and the history. They are the, you can say, the treaties, the actual treaties, living, breathing treaties. And because of our elders, our way of life still exists. Nobody puts the elders first. If people talked about honor in this country, then the elders should be the key to the future. Elderly people today are limited on this reservation. Once we lose the elders, we're going to lose everything. Traditional elders are outspoken in the fight for accountability and change. Consequently, they are neglected by the OST government and often abused by those entrusted to care for them. I said we're slave to them. Same like we're in a concentration camp. That's what we are now. The way they carried on, the way they treat us. How can we do it? Where we have to go to to get help? There's no one here. Every time we go someplace, ask for help. We can't do it. Any. We can't. There's no money. We can't help you. So we get along the best we can. I'm just sick and tired of what's going on there. A lot of people need help. Right now, a lot of people need food. The lights are shut off. 
the propane is out. I'm an elderly and whenever I need help from the tribe, uh, I don't even get help from there. We asked for help and then they said, they said no, they don't, we don't have no money. Then I'll go to Pine Ridge, then I said, there's no money here. So all I say, well, what happened to the money that the elderly people get, I guess, from Washington? I said, I don't know. So that's how come these elderly right around here don't hardly get no help. We're freedom fighters. <laughs> Maybe that's why no one, nobody don't want to help <laughs> The OST government system neglects to fulfill even the most basic needs of our elders on Pine Ridge. As a result, poverty-stricken elders suffer every day from hunger and malnutrition. It's scary how they feed the elders. At least they could let us have a good meal, peaceful meal for elderly. They didn't go that far. I open that storage room and hear a big old sugar can, about that big, it's full of sugar. I look down, there's worms. The white and the black heads. Look at worms, and I got up and I left. Went the other way and I said, well, maybe this flower is good, because they were in a container, so we, Swift it, and here there's a mouse in there. <laughs> this is what they were feeding the elders. We really, really have a hard time trying to get help. We went to superintendent four times. I went to the tribal president three times. I went to the council meeting four times. That council lady told me, Lorraine, this has been five years. You should just forget and live on like that. In protest of these conditions, elders in the Porcupine District of Pine Ridge occupied their meals for the elderly building for 34 days in 2011 to force action on the abuse, neglect, malnutrition, and theft of elderly funds they experienced. Nobody would listen to the elders. They tried the court system. They tried the BIA, they tried the tribal council, and other, you know, um, resources that were available. And last but not least, they brought it to Stormheart. Because they exhausted all their remedies from every level that you can think of. And we told them one thing. You come to us, there's only going to be done one way. We're going to take possession of that building and we're going to hold it. And we wouldn't give it to them until they met these elders' demands. That was the only way to get some attention to this abuse and this stuff going on. We called the health department so they came. I got that written statement. They condemn everything. Money intended for elders, the meals for the elderly program, and to rebuild their building was stolen. And even today, elders in the Porcupine District often have no reliable source of food. A lot of elders don't get their meals though. They're supposed to be giving these elderly meals to the elders that need it, that can't make it transportation-wise to the building. They go out and they're supposed to deliver them, and a lot of times it doesn't happen. They see us like we're dogs. I pity um, uh, my aunt, Auntie um, Cecilia, begging for food. They don't want to help her. That. It's the biggest genocidal holocaust when you destroy your own professors. And that's your grandmas and grandpas. Those are your professors to the nation that they're from. And that's Lakota. The fate of the Lakota Oyate is intertwined with the ecology of the land, patriarchal systems of control that inflict abuse and neglect on Lakota grandmothers do the same to Grandmother Earth. We know what it is to live off the earth, the land, the trees, the four-legged. We know about them things. We have a value system there. Our culture is tens of thousands of years old. It's not just a few hundred years old. It's tens of thousands of years old, and it might even be older than that. 
The only way you could live within this geographic area was how our people lived. And if you look any place all over the world where indigenous people live in their own way within that geographic area, that's the only way people, human beings should live. Otherwise, they're going to destroy it. And that's what has happened over the whole world. When a man moves away from nature, his heart becomes hard. For thousands of years, Lakota people have lived freely on the land in togetherness with our buffalo relatives, the Tatanka Oyate. This sacred way of life was intentionally targeted by the U.S. government. Consequences of the buffalo slaughter are still felt today. We know this buffalo is very sacred to us. Everything in that buffalo survive us. Hide, meat, the skulls. Everything. We make knives, spoons, dippers. Everything of this buffalo is sacred to us. We have that symbiotic spiritual relationship with the buffalo and with all the animals, with the earth, with the Black Hills. We don't have that. And we're not really who we are supposed to be. Seemingly unable to stop destroying life in its path, America desecrates our sacred places, which are sites of profound cultural, spiritual, and ancestral importance that ensure the well-being of all life. Christianity is 2,000 years old, okay? Judaism, four to six. Some say 4,000, some say 6,000, okay? We are tens and tens of thousands of years old. We know these sites in a totally different way. Now, if someone was to bomb the Vatican, would that be just a big, huge, oh, there's laws in the United States if you desecrate a church. Oh my God, you'll go to jail, you'll go to prison. Okay. These sacred sites have been around for tens of thousands of years. Our ancestors, 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 all were there, walked there, prayed there did ceremonies there that we still do. To destroy those, no. You don't do that to sacred places. Like the Black Hills, like Cave Hills, where I was telling you about these. That was a major sacred site. There were hundreds of caves. There were hundreds of, uh, people call it rock art. Those are spirit messages. Hundreds of them, maybe thousands. And they were destroyed. It's like seeing one of your family members dead. It's, it's uh, probably even more than that. Unlike the protection sacred sites receive in other countries, the United States has done little to protect the holy places of Indian tribes. Often, in fact, the federal government knowingly desecrates these sites. Yes, you can comment all you want on environmental impact studies and you can go to the environmental quality committees or whatever they are. And they'll all look at us real nice and give us cups of coffee and say, oh yes, we hear you, and they'll do whatever they want. We do not inherit Mother Earth from our ancestors. We borrow her from our children. In spite of the outrage and outcry of our people, the U.S. continues to permit corporations to ravage and rape Grandmother Earth and to pollute our drinking water. As they leave our lands in ruin, they steal from us our means of survival and our future. Corporations have been destroying the rights of the two-legged right before your eyes, but you're just too blind to admit it. This is where the physical genocide of our people is coming in because we have more than 3,000 abandoned open pit uranium mines that have been here for 40 years. All that radioactive dust constantly, we're breathing it in constantly. It, it has gone down into the groundwater, we drink it. It's on the surface water, we drink it again. Um, the cattle, all the animals, horses, everything, they eat the grass. We pick berries, all those are covered with radioactive dust. By the mid-1970s, there were 380 uranium leases on native land and only four on public or acquired land. Winona LaDuke wrote an article in 1992 
And in there, she talks about a public policy that was written under President Nixon in 1972, declaring our treaty territory, our region, a national sacrifice area to radiation. That's not genocide. They did it two places, with us here, the Great Sioux Nation here, and in the Southwest with the Navajos. The Crow Butte Resources Uranium Mine has had leaks and spills every year since they have been in operation. We have no clean drinking water at all, none. Where is the animals? The birds used to be noisy here all summer, no more. The ecology of the whole system is toxic. They're not going to come around. They know. West side of the reservation, elk hunting, deer hunting, antelope, you name it. They're not there anymore. Yeah, rangers bring a whole bunch there and turn them loose. Within a year, they're not there. They move away. West side of this reservation is uranium into Wyoming. Society doesn't want to understand that until the sickness occurs. Then, by then, it's too late. We have the lowest life expectancy on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Radioactive elements, heavy metals, and toxic chemicals in drinking water on Pine Ridge pass from mother to child during pregnancy and cause birth defects and miscarriages at a rate six times higher than the U.S. national average. We have had more noticing more birth defects and miscarriages. More miscarriages than anything. Young girls from the age capacity of 14 and 19 are failing to ovulate right now. That's genocidal warfare, America, which you're still doing. This country is so filled with denial from head start, you know, to, to all. It's like they cannot take ownership of this devastation, the desecration, this constant destruction. I would just like somebody to stand up and say, you know, we got to stop destroying this, this earth. This is what a corporation will do to you when you uncover their behavior. They want to destroy their truth. So if they say that the commonwealth of American money is value, think again, America. It's not valued. See? That's all they do anyway. That's what they're good for. They're designed to destroy. The annihilation of the buffalo, our forced confinement to the arid Pine Ridge Reservation, and our resulting dependency on food rations provided by the government have brought diseases never before seen by our people. Diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are epidemic here, with rates up to nine times higher than the U.S. national average. We never had any type of health issues until you guys got here. Our people ate boiled meats and baked meats. Everything was either boiled or baked. We live off the choke cherries, the team sealers, the bought turnips. That's our food, our nourishment. So now they're trying to cut us off by, you need a permit to pick that. When they moved us onto that reservation, for we could have our sovereignty there, when they put us on our internment camps and our prison, and we had to eat what they told us we had to eat because we could no longer have weapons to go out and take our livelihood and make our livelihood, we started getting sick. Our bodies are not genetically attuned to carbohydrates and starches. Our bodies are attuned to proteins, um, more pure vegetables and fruits. 
and the commodities are chock full of carbohydrates, starches, canned foods, salt, a lot of salt. I look at our people, we are so unhealthy, myself included, because of what we were taught to eat. Gallbladder disease, heart disease, diabetes, rampant. There's a lot of, a lot of sick people too, a lot of diabetes, a lot of people have cancer. We have the highest cancer rate in the whole country. Despite being responsible for our desperate conditions of life, the U.S. government fails to provide adequate health care and medical services through the Indian Health Service Program, IHS. We've, you know, come a long way to try to trust Indian Health Services. They're not working. The health care, to be honest with you, we can honestly say there really isn't one because uh, we have an IHS, a hospital right in Pine Ridge, but... Uh, the care that the people should be getting, they're not getting. And uh, it's not helping the people at all because some of the doctors that come in are practicing. And uh, they're practicing on our Indian people right now. We don't have no good doctors. The doctors are just training. They're getting training here. They, they come here and they trying to learn about things and they gave us the wrong medicine. A lot of times the diagnosis is a misdiagnosis and they'll give, you know, medicine that that they think might help and then they send the people home. And we've seen a lot of accidents and uh, otherwise deaths that have occurred on the reservation because of that. My granddaughter, she had a car wreck. She had a car wreck and she got broken ribs and a chest. She got really hurt, bad hurt. And here they took him to hospital and his doctor said she gave him pain pills and they could take it, take her home, she's all right. So they brought her home and she got sick and she almost died. They wanna do away with us, totally, completely. One way or the other. For more than 150 years, the U.S. government has consistently exercised a policy towards the Lakota people. Assimilate or die. They made us understand one thing. Be white. The U.S. enforces policies to crush our traditional way of life and our ancient wisdom and understandings, which are rooted in our beautiful language. Our language, long time ago, old people said, your language is sacred. That's what the most precious thing that we have to explain who we are. That's the identity of the Lakota. Speak Lakota and you will know who you are. The first and foremost is the language. That is why you probably heard us speak the Lakota language right now. What I just said was the language still exists in today's society and, and if it continues to exist in the future we have the capability and ability to survive in the future but once the language dies everything dies with it the culture dies the history dies and you lose the reservation. Our songs, our power, are based on our language. Our spirituality are based, is based on our language. Our prayers are based on our language. We might be poor, but we have our language behind us. We have a true meaning, understanding of why this tree grows here. We have an understanding of why the grass grows, why the sun comes up. Whereas today, our kids are losing that. When someone doesn't know the language, they speak English only, like kids today. They grow up from being hokshichala, baby, growing up. They're taught the English language. If you sit down with them and you talk to them, 
they don't have the ideas, the sense, the mentality of Lakota anymore. Since the boarding school era began in 1878, the U.S. government has forcibly removed Lakota children from their families to kill the Indian and assimilate them to the white man's ways. Kill the Indian, save the man attitude. The forced assimilation has caused the cultural genocide. They took all the children away to boarding schools, um, made them totally unable to practice their culture or speak their language. We lived in a log house and uh, we were happy and we're doing good. We're, you know, our dad was working and our, the, the, no alcohol or drugs, you know, no abuse of any kind. I remember this little old lady coming in with a clipboard. When she came in, she wrote something down and she left. I remember how she looked and I know where I was standing on the bed when she came in. All I had to do was write it down, which made it fact, and then they removed you. The next thing you know, we're being loaded onto army buses and they took us to a town called Mobridge. When we got there, there were army buses all in a big circle, all filled with native kids. We had no idea or clue where we were going. We ended up in Pierre, South Dakota, the capital of South Dakota. We ended up there, there's a boarding school there, and that's where they unloaded us. That was a national policy, to kidnap or just legally take Native children from their parents. They gave these prisoner of war camps to these different uh, sex uh, church, churches to veil their mission schools and to take the children away and teach them about Christianity. Christianity has devastated our people because they did not understand how we prayed were heathens. They took our children, they put them in boarding schools, or they just simply took them away and beat them if they didn't learn, quote, unquote, Christianity. Christianity has been the failure in every religion. And it's a failure in indigenous country because it don't belong here. The sacred pipe belongs here. Chanupake chawaka. And don't keep talking, just like this earth and the four legged and the wing creeps in the trees. That's the real power. Native students were beaten, whipped, shaken, burned, thrown downstairs, placed in stressed positions, and deprived of food. Their heads were smashed against walls, and they were made to stand naked before their classmates. The boarding school is really mean to people. Sometimes they, they punished us. If we talk our own language, they punished us. So when we talk our own language, we have to whisper. Many times children were killed when they spoke their language. The Bureau of Indian Affairs committed these acts against the children entrusted to its boarding schools brutalizing them emotionally, psychologically, physically, and spiritually. They've succeeded in killing the native, the indigenous spirit in almost everyone. As a result of the cultural assimilation of the boarding school era, our people struggle to preserve our indigenous identity values, and language. Not just the Lakota people. It's all the nations of this country, all our nations. The elders are our teachers. And most of our elders nowadays are forgetting their jobs. They're the boarding school people. They're the ones that were sent to these boarding schools and beaten if they spoke their language or beaten if they did their artwork. So they were encouraged by a board, a ruler, a stick, or whatever you want, not to have those values that they were given. Elders, do your job. Teach the young ones. Today, the foster care system perpetuates the policy of assimilation through government-sanctioned kidnappings.
A generation of children is once again losing its connection to its culture. This time it's through state-run foster care. We suffer irreparable emotional trauma as the government steals our children because of cultural bias, retribution, and financial incentives. 90% of our children are placed in non-Lakota homes or group care where our culture is lost. I want to uh, report uh, what happened to me and my son. I said, what's the matter, Romeo? I said, you got a cramp, and he, he, his arm was like this. So I said, you okay? And then he went and he, he looked at me and he, he just said, he said, ouchie. We didn't know what he did. The only thing, me and Justin, we, we kept thinking the bed frame was kind of sticking out about that much. After 10, that cramp didn't go away, he was still like this. I went and I told him, I said, Romeo, come on, let's go, we're gonna take you to the hospital. We showed Dr. Um, Josie Angel Torres his shoulder. And that's when Dr. Josie Angel Torres said, okay, well, to me, it looks like muscle spasms. It looks like it's just like cramped up. And then he said, what we're going to do is we're going to do some x-rays just to be in case, just in case. And after looking at the x-rays, he said, to me, it's like he's doing it himself. He's going like this himself. And he said, right here, you can see his muscle. He said, he's just faking it. And he's just doing that so he can miss school. And he didn't give him a, a brace. He said, well, if he's feeling pain, just give him the Tylenol with codeine. When I let him go to school, the nurse told me 20 minutes later how bad it was. I took him to the emergency department. They asked me what happened. I told the doctor what happened, and he accused me and insisted on me um, abusing my son. He kept accusing me and insisting that I, I, I was the one that hit my son, but nobody hit my son. And when he got up, we, when he told us what happened, you know, we, you know, tended him right away. But he kept insisting on me, you know, being the abuser. And when he kept insisting, insisting, I kept telling him, I said, no, I haven't. And, you know, he just kept insisting, insisting, and getting louder and louder. And I told him finally, I said, you know, are you discriminating me? I said, because that's all you're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about my son, and all you're doing is that, accusing me. They told me that, they said, Pedro, you ain't going to have custody of your son. We are going to take custody of your son. And I told him, I said, well, could I say at least goodbye? Could I at least give him a hug? And that's when they told me, they said, Pedro, they took him while you were doing the questioning. When they took him, they took him to Rapid City Regional. Romeo was released from Regional Hospital, and I said, what's wrong, with, um, how's he doing, is he okay? So he said it was only a sprain, and they went and they, um, they, they went and they gave him a sling, they um, gave him a sling and they released him. They attended it and wrapped him, gave him a sling and released him. The only one that was there was Vince from Lowo, and that was the only one that was there that I knew. And when, after they released Romeo, um, Vince put him in a foster home in Rapid. So they used foster kids to ask for legal, or, um, um, legal fees. And when they get the legal fee money, they go and they have meetings. The meeting ain't a meeting. It's just them dividing the check and deciding how they're going to divide it. After they divide it, then they give the, um, the, the people that they're saying the case was for, they give them to the run around until they're 21. I don't know if he's, you know, worried, crying, scared, because he, they won't give me that, no information on him. I've seen young girls, little young white girl, tell me her troubles. A little white girl telling a f***ing Indian. This was in Pennsylvania, in Saltburg, Pennsylvania, this little white girl, nine years old. She said, I like everything that you say, Indian. <laughs> she called me an Indian, too. I loved it. And this little girl, she said, everything you say is true, and I love that. Unfortunately, I don't have that at my home. Said, Why not? Because my mom and dad, they put me in front of a TV and they leave out the door. What? She says, yeah. They don't love me. Come here. I pulled her to close me. That little girl hugged me and I hugged her and her body shook, man. And there's white people sitting there. I'm like, what the f is wrong with you guys doing this to your kids? Eat her all. Mouths drop wide open. <laughs> Eyes got big. You're creating this, man. But that's 
happening every day in every American's household. There's no value of love for your children. That's child neglect, right? That's child abuse, huh? Oh, but that's okay for white people to do that to their own kids. And everybody else does it. We either have our kids taken away from them or we're sanctioned or we're put in jail. But it's okay for you white people. Portrayed as a universally accepted standard of excellence, the Western educational system continues the cultural genocide of Lakota people by forced indoctrination into American culture, social institutions, values, customs, and language. I believe in knowledge, but I don't, want, I don't believe in white man's education. I could count to times I cried on one hand. I said, I just came down from the hill. <clears throat> I said, I never cried so hard. I know what I know what it's like to cry. I had to learn on my own about our way of life. And I had to learn that way what it's like to feel, how to feel again, to be connected. Because I was a cold SOB. I was raised in a boarding school. The boarding school mentality is still here today. A forced education that's sometimes physical and emotionally hurting our kids is still here today. We talk about forced education. It's still forced today because we're literally telling as you know, if you look at administrators, look at a parent and say, your child needs to come to school. You're pulling that child away from a fam family setting that we as Lakota say is the strongest point of a child, family. Because that child learns from the mom and dad, the grandparents, aunts and uncles of who they are as, you know, identity. When you pull that child out and that child has no foundation, you have a 100% chance that child, that child you can change how you want, how you want that child. You can build it and build that child yourself. But that child is going to be affected because it's losing everything. It's losing the culture, the language, the history, even spirituality. In the high school department where I was teaching, they started um, speaking a lot of language in the other classrooms. And those teachers were telling them that they can't do that. They can only do it in my classroom. And um, they said, well, this is our language. Uh, you know, we're getting ready when we get into Mr. Lazebad's class and we're going to speak Lakotas. We're getting re ourselves ready. And after a while, two of the teachers started removing the kids. Literally, like they were little elementary kids. They would put them out in the hallway so they wouldn't speak Lakota in their classroom. The department chair came to my classroom and told me that uh, anything that I do in a classroom cannot leave my classroom. Teaching of the language, speaking of the language. Anything pertaining to our culture and our language cannot leave my classroom. The teacher started kind of harassing our daughter, our younger one, and then harassing my wife because they're saying that she's not learning. They're pretty much saying that she was illiterate because she spoke the language, her, her native language. We were hoping they were going to work with us. But pretty soon um, they were telling us that our young one, they were going to fail her. It, to us, they were saying that she was a failure because she spoke the language, her native language. And then we ha ended up having a meeting with the principal. And she came out and told me and my wife, you know, to our face that don't be speaking Lakota with her at home. That really hurt us because everything that we wanted to do was breaking down because this system, a Christian system that came in, was trying, was, we felt like was attacking us because we kept our language, our culture, and our history. To keep our language strong, we had to keep it going. But the system wanted us to, to break down. As long as they, they say they're using, they're teaching the language, teaching the language in the school system, millions of dollars come into the school. 
But if you go to all these schools, they're not teaching the language. Can they survive as a person out there? Yeah, they probably could. Can that one survive as a Lakota out there? No. Because there's no Lakotas out there. His language is going to be gone because he can't speak his language to anybody. Everything about him is identity. He has nothing out there. So as a Lakota, we can't survive out there. As a consequence of the comprehensive effort to dominate and discriminate against Lakota people and to steal our lands, cultural identity, resources, and health, we now face a level of impoverishment few would have believed possible. One third of homes on Pine Ridge lack clean water, 40% lack electricity, 60% are substandard, 89% of our people live below the federal poverty line. Every winter our precious elders die from hypothermia due to lack of adequate heating. Since 1934 to 2012, we have billions of dollars come in and look at our infrastructure, look at our economy. You've just been here, but well, look what happened to the money. Every turn it's being misused, rerouted into the, into the personal account. That's how we, we cannot progress. The policies of the United States government towards Indian tribes and the breaking of covenants with Indian tribes have contributed to the severe social ills and economic troubles in many Native communities today. Because we're on a sovereign reservation and you're fighting the same people that's protecting the American government's, you know, justice system and all this other then the poor people go without. I have 11 kids, eight boys and three girls, and there's only three of them that are adult. They stay at my mom's house um, up in Rapid City. We don't want to subject them to this. You know, they shouldn't have to suffer right along with this in the conditions, especially in the wintertime. I mean, because we've been having some really cold winters, the wind chill factor. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of snow, but the wind chill factor at times is minus 40 below, minus 60 below, you know. If you go in there, you'll see it's pretty much bare because we had to burn everything, anything, all of our shoes, our clothes, just to stay warm because I kept asking them for assistance. And I said, even if you were to just bring some of that pine wood over or cut it or let us use your chainsaw. People are really poor and people don't have no place to go, the homeless people. Really sad. I think everything's wrong. To me it is. Sometimes I was thinking about it. Why it's this way? Why we have to go through a hardship? Why do we have to go all, go through all this? Lakota people, years back, we don't live like that. We live a good life that time. But nowadays, I think we lived in hell. <laughs> the way things are. Everything's hard for us. They said we're elderly, we like to make trouble, we have like to make complaints. That's how the tribal council said. They don't care for the people, but they're working there because they want the money. They always talk, they're going to say, we're going to help the Indians, we're going to help you guys, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And when the time comes, when they got in, nobody helped. I think when they get in there, they get that fill that money, and then they forget about everything they were campaigning, everything they were going to do. They, that greed. You know, I was once told by a philosopher that the white people were an ill breed of people because they're so green. We're not trying to rich. We're not trying to live in a big house like that. We're not trying. We just want to live here with our grandchildren and have a good life. I want the people to know how we get along, hard time, no home, no food. And the money that comes in, they, they don't even give it to us. They, they help themselves. This is the American empire. This is the way America wants you to live. 
the trauma of shame, fear, and anger has passed from one generation to the next and manifests itself in the rampant alcoholism, drug abuse, and domestic violence that plague Indian country. There's an epidemic on that reservation. It's called alcoholism. Plagued with drugs. Plagued with domestic abuse. Plagued with women violence of rape. And plagued with debauching minor children. And you people are responsible for that. You, America, and your little brothers known as half-breeds. I am angry because I have to live with that. Two miles from the dry Pine Ridge Indian Reservation is the notorious town of White Clay, Nebraska, population 10, where four stores sell more than 13,000 cans of beer every day. You see the White Clay how it is. Today you see them laying over there. Feel sad, makes me sad, you know. White Clay exists solely to profit from the illegal sale of alcohol to residents of Pine Ridge, where alcoholism affects eight out of 10 families. All the drug dealers, marijuana dealers, all kinds of beer, they sell some beer that big people crazy. And so when they drink those beer, people get crazy and they do awful things. I think the government let them do it. They let them do it. They want to see all the Indians die, die for, from the alcohol. I think he wanted to. I think the government don't care about the Indians. Local, state, and federal authorities predictably shuffle responsibility and jurisdiction over the problem. Regarding a lawsuit, filed by the Oglala Sioux Tribe against beer manufacturers that supply white clay stores with volumes of beer far in excess of an amount that could be sold in compliance with the laws of the state of Nebraska, U.S. District Judge John M. Gerard wrote, there is in fact little question that alcohol sold in white clay contributes significantly to tragic conditions on the reservation. Yet he proceeded to pass on the responsibility to the state of Nebraska. We want to close down white clay. All the sales of alcohol here for our children, our next generations, for the people and all the deaths that are happening here because of alcohol. Everyone's affected and we're tired of it. We don't want it no more. No more alcohol. The constitutional bylaw of the Glossy tribe, <clears throat> you know, 88.01 states that alcohol is it's abolished from the reservation and it can't be allowed. So what we're there to do is to enforce that. We're stopping cars, we're stopping cars and everything like that, you know, asked if they had alcohol. And, you know, we're um, basically doing our best to enforce the, you know, the alcohol ban from the, on the reservation. He started coming towards me and everything, and he swung at me, but, you know, I mean, I, I got out of the way. He tried to fight me. Let's go! My fucking wife comes through here and you guys fucking do something? You guys want something now? Want a broke car? That man that approached me, you know, <laughs> he was in this, uh, he came out of this blue truck and everything and he, he wasn't driving, he was the passenger, but the driver was a white person, you know? And that driver, that driver works there in White Clay. He's protecting White Clay. He sent that guy, that native guy, as a plant, you know? He sent them there uh, on a mission to try to start, so, start something. And the police just stood there. You know, they just stood there. 90% of crimes committed on the reservation are alcohol related. Lakota women are raped or sexually assaulted at a rate four times the U.S. national average. The U.S. Department of Justice, which used the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010 to expand its jurisdiction in sovereign Lakota territory, fails to pursue charges in two-thirds of reported sexual assault crimes. I call it planned genocide by the American government. 
so that there are cracks in the in the system, the whole system. The whole uh, system of justice is so flawed that women all the way across the board, down to children, are total victims with no no recourse. It's really, really difficult to have a sexual assault, let, a, let alone a domestic assault, um, prosecuted. I'll tell you a case. 14-year-old girl, sexually assaulted, statutory rape, by a bus driver at a state school on the reservation on Pine Ridge. He assaults this girl all the time at school in the bus garage. He grooms her so that she will lie for him. Um, none of the school personnel will report this assault because he's a wealthy white rancher and he's one of their fellow employees and almost all the people that work at the school are ranchers and they're all friends and they all go to the same rodeos and they all help each other when they have brandings and everything. So they never report it. None of the teachers, or principal, or counselors, bus drivers, maintenance men. He also is friends with the U.S. Attorney. He's also friends with the public defender and the BIA superintendent. She lives with that white rancher. And she has a baby for him. Then he starts beating her up. He beats her up until she finally leaves. But he keeps the baby. She goes to court. Court says, you have to prove you can uh, support this baby. She never finished the 10th grade. The grandmother tries every which way to get the tribal police, the state police, the FBI, everybody to file charges when this girl, when she found out what this girl was doing. Nothing happened. The Fed said it's state school, has to go through the state. The state says it's on a federal reservation. The feds have to handle it. Nobody will touch this case. That little girl was my granddaughter. The father was my son. I'm the grandma who tried. I have to pray every day because I have such rage. <laughs> Not just at that rapist, at the judge, at the public defender who is his friend, at the U.S. attorney who is his friend, at every single person on that school who worked there, who knew, who didn't report it, at every single person on that school board who knew who didn't do a damn thing about it. At every tribal police officer I went to, I have such rage. I have to pray. I pray and I ask the Creator. Nothing more I can do. So please take care of it. Every family I know this has happened to, whether it's a woman my age, or an older aunt or their mother, a daughter, a granddaughter. It has happened to. And with these cracks in the jurisdiction, where do we go? We have no place to go. We have no place. I mean, yeah, you can report it. Will anything happen? Look at We reported it all over the place. And nothing could happen because they always find a convenient way for nothing to happen if it's an Indian person. The U.S. government has taken everything from us. Our freedom, our sovereignty, our elders, our land, our life way, our children, and now even the hope of many of our people. Our despair is so profound that our young people abandon hope to suicide at a rate one and a half times higher than the U.S. national average. I have never seen any real Indian promote genocide by encouraging the dilution of Indian blood. A tribe is not perpetuated by non-Indian blood and that is a fact. If our ancestors had taken this attitude 500 years ago, we would not exist as Indians today. The other side of that mountain, there is a white people there. And when you go to the other side of the hill, you're going to be smell like a white man.
and your traditional is going to be gone. And your language is gone. So hey, we are lost already. We lost, they lost their language. So younger kids can't talk Indian anymore. Promoted through American miseducation, foster care, and urban relocation, the American melting pot concept encourages the loss of native cultural identity through dilution of native blood. You give us the ability to get off the reservation, then you kill us from our identity of our culture's upbringing. The urban Indian, we call them urban Indian, they're out there, off the reservation. They don't know, they don't know how, know nothing about the traditional. They don't care to learn it. Facing discrimination in white society, many mixed-blood Indians return to Pine Ridge where they inflict learned oppression on full-blooded and traditional Lakota people, exploit the system of land allotments and leases to steal common lands and make money off our sacred ceremonies. They were abused by white America citizens. White America looked at their own little brothers as the Indians. So they abused them. They came back and inflict that same abuse upon us full bloods. The government needs to give them credit share, so benefit. When you turn 18, you get all this, Tim and a horse, plow, like that. But this half-breeds bought it off of them cheap, because we're not farmers. When they bought everything off of them, he said, you could sell their land to try to feed your kids. What they don't know is that money belongs to the Indians. So they're actually giving your money for your land. The law that we have, you cannot give no tribal land to anybody, or you cannot sell no tribal land at all. Yet, the half-breeds got together and they started another community over there without asking us. Thunder Valley. They gave them 80 acres there to build that. Who did that? We don't know yet. And he runs that sentence. He's not even supposed to do that. He's not an Indian. Then he went sweat. He even have a ghost dance so his daughter hang herself. You know, these are the sacred thing you don't play around with. Half breed. They, they're just doing any old ways. Even the sacred mountains that we have, they're taking over. Bear Butte Mountain. I myself go over there for Hubble HI for years. I have to be a way on top by myself to do my vision quest up there. And now I can't do that because there's too many. We don't know who they are. And Half Breeze took our, our pipe. Half breeds took everything from us. They have breeds. They can't speak Indian. They make money off of it. So that's Humbletter. All this. They took it. It's not it's not as sacred as it used to be. Out of place in traditional Lakota society. Western educated mixed bloods often find positions within the Oglala Sioux tribe, through which the U.S. government exploits the strategy of divide and conquer to continue the war on traditional Lakota people. The mixed bloods were getting into the political realm and they ostracized a lot of our uh, traditional people that spoke the Lakota language. Wilson, Dick Wilson, he had a president and he, he, don't, like, he don't like us. Dick Wilson, he hired a lot of people to, we call them goons. We're all full bloods, and they're half-breeds, they're goons. And they were, you know, having Pine Ridge's militia on them, which was the goon squad. They trying to kill all of them uh, down there. And uh, the goons are really no good that time. A lot of Indians got killed. They're really mean to us. Mean to everybody, these goons. And now, what happened? Why, they, they had high-powered gun, 
and they even have a machine gun out in all kinds of machine gun. They paramilitarized the whole Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. They were receiving military arsenal. That time and that era showed that mixed bloods wanted to neutralize the traditional concepts of life like in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the other eight reservations that still were striving to hang on to their cultural identity. And they're still doing it to this godforsaken day on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Today, this broken system runs rampant, fueled by drug and alcohol trafficking, creating a formidable fusion of corruption, theft of tribal funds, and oppression that further impoverishes full blood and traditional Lakota. The whole system down there is very, very corrupt, and it's sad. Sad to say that, because those are my people. But it is very, very corrupt. It's a part of oppression, you know. The oppressed will become the oppressors, and that um, horizontal oppression, that's what happens, and that's what has happened now. The tribe gets federal money to run programs, to hire people to do work, to provide services, like a government is supposed to. But when half of that money, or maybe even less, is used to actually provide the government services, and then the other half is, is given out as payoffs to keep people doing the corruption, then you have the system that you have down there. And that's what I discovered as a treasurer. They go right to Washington, D.C. and say, well, we're the poorest county in the whole United States. We live in private area. We need more money. This is how much Indians there are. They use us to get money again, which we don't get nothing. We as elders of the Pine Ridge Reservation filed this complaint on our Oglala Sioux Tribal Council members. Elderly abuse is based on hunger, malnutrition, hardship, mental and psychological abuse, and visible theft of tribal funds. They have to answer for this. Why is there hunger? Why is there malnutrition? Why is there hardship? Why is there mental and psychological abuse? And what about visible theft of tribal funds? There's a, a, you know, a, just like I said, a visible fraud going on, theft. But the Attorney General won't take those complaints because they said the tribe's sovereign. And so you need to take care of those problems there. But when we go to the court, you went with us, you've seen up to today, no action was taken seriously. Or no action was taken against my complaint of elderly abuse. And, and they're still sitting there. Nothing has happened. I just call. Nothing happened. The system's so crooked where they would, um, there's drug dealers, ringleaders. The ringleaders are the main people, the brains of the operation. These ringleaders, they also um, have a pack with the bootleggers. The bootleggers, and they also have a pack with the embezzlers, people who embezzle from the tribal building. I used to be with Jerry Respects Nothing. Her name's Geraldine Respects Nothing. She was a drug dealer and a bootlegger. And when I was with her, she there was a night she told me, she said, okay, get, grab everything, grab everything. And I was like, what? And she said, grab all the beer. So I grabbed all her beer and a, on a um, cooler, and I spilled it in a big old duffel bag. And I grabbed all her half of G's, and I put them in a different duffel bag. We had to put some clothes in there so they won't break. And then I got all her um, drugs. She was selling cocaine and um, crack cocaine because she knew how to make um, crack out of cocaine. So she started crack cocaine and cocaine, and then she I put that in the bag. We took it to um, the Looks Twice's ranch. And when we went there, there was a whole bunch of tables, tables all around. And each table was registered to somebody. And it was like um, bootleggers and drug dealers. So each table was registered, and one table was judge and respects and everything. So when we got there, she told me to lay out everything, one can of everything. So I laid out all her cans of, um, big cans, you know, and then, um, the different types of um, liquor, and then the um, cocaine and the crystal meth, or not crystal meth, um, crack rock. And 
Then over here was another drug dealer and bootlegger. Over here was another drug dealer bootlegger. Each table had a different drug dealer, drug dealer or either bootlegger. And when they did that, the reason why they did that is call it the candy store. And that's the tribal council is candy store. The tribal council, the main guy that was there was John Still. John Still, that's how I met John Still through Joe Dean Respects Nothing. She introduced me to John Still. And John Still went over there with the tribal council and they went to every table. Shake everybody's hand, talk, greet it, you know, and they picked out everything they wanted. So the tribal council buys drugs and um, liquor and alcohol off the drug dealers and bootleggers. They all got people that work in office jobs, you know, the older ones, their parents. They work in the tribal building, they work in the hospital, they work in all these office jobs, and they're the embezzlers. And they found out they embezzled six million, oh, six million twenty-eight thousand. And all that money went into their drug um, organization. So they put their money into buying drugs to um, 10 times their money or multiply their money. So all their money goes into their drug organization, you know. And their, um, like if they need a, to pay a cop off or a CI off, you know, they'll use that money to pay them off, you know, underneath the table. They all work together. The, the tribal council, the police, there's even FBI's that, you know, that cover up for people. The evidence I had showed how it went all the way up to Washington, D.C., to senators in Washington, D.C., the corruption at Pine Ridge. I had all the documents in my hand. I went to the FBI. I went to the U.S. attorney asking for prosecution with the evidence. What happened? Nothing. Nothing. I wrote my book trying to expose this corruption. And I called it Testimony for the Innocent, for all the innocent people at Pine Ridge who don't get the government services, for all the innocent people at Pine Ridge who try to expose the corruption and lose their jobs, and for all the innocent taxpayers who pay in federal tax dollars so it can be used properly, and it's not. And the federal government is the one that sees to it that it's not. We, the Freedom Fighters, the traditional Lakota Oyate, the full-blooded Indians and the activists who stand up to the genocide of our people face retaliation from the U.S. government, the BIA, the OST, tribal police, and the judiciary. We are labeled enemies of the state, even terrorists, and are victims of murder, intimidation, beatings, threats, vandalism, false arrest, and incarceration. My life was in danger all during that time in the life of my children. It's not in my book about all that we went through all the warnings we had, um, everything that was going to happen to me and to my kids if I didn't stop. But I couldn't stop. It wasn't right. That, that was my culture. You have to be honest. My daughter lived here too with her three boys and I would babysit. And she had just a little tiny car. So we let her use the, our big station wagon and she let me drive around her little car. So everybody thought that little yellow car was my car. Well, we were going to um, Sundance, and we had to take our, our tents and our sleeping, all of our food, everything. We were going to be gone for a week. So we traded cars. She headed up over that viaduct, and when she got to the top, the brakes gave up. And then she went down, and no more brakes, and she had her three little boys in there. To get to her house, she had to go up a hill, turn, and go up a real steep driveway. She just kept praying, praying, and she did it. And when she got to the top then, she called her brother, my son, who is a diesel mechanic. He came over and he checked it out and somebody had professionally pinched the brakes. You don't cut them from the bottom because in the fluid, you profess, they professionally pinch them up on top of the brake lines so that you'll have to drive like a mile or so and the pressure and then they bust open and then you have no brakes. It's hard to tell anybody when people are scared. There's a fear. People fear that if they say anything, they'll lose their emergency help. And we were threatened uh, uh, by the tribal government that if they, see, if they see any people there and if they go ask for emergency help, they're not going to help. They'll blacklist them. And there's a lot of people that are blacklisted on this reservation. He's one of them. We can't go over there and tell them what's going on. They'll arrest us, they'll put us in. And they'll probably throw the keys away when they put us in. 
That's how bad it is around here for the real Lakotas. And they're scared. They're scared to do anything. Today, you go over there and say something about the government, they might shoot you. Charles Richards boys put a gun on me and Cassie and my kids. They put a gun at us and started running down the road with it, pointing it at us. So we went real fast and reported it. I told Justin Hooper, I said, Justin, I said, we're getting retaliated on because all the information we've been telling you, somebody's um, letting them know, there's an informer letting them know that we're the ones that are, you know, um, giving you guys all the information and they're retaliating on us. And Justin Hooper said, well, the best thing for you guys to do is move. I got sister-in-law and two grandchildren got killed on the scenic road. My brother got killed up in the hill. He lives all by himself. Those things happen to us. And it hurts, you know, it really hurts. Hell, even this message, what we're telling you about, we can get knocked off, me and my elders. Long time ago, Indians fight back. Long time ago, like, like they killed Custer over to Montana. That time, the Indians not scared, so they fight back. But today we can we can fight the government. We can't do that. We can't fight the law. The power, they have power. We can't do nothing. That's what we're facing, a big, giant, giant, you know, uh, agency. And I don't know if any of us will ever get our message through. We're treated as subhuman. And they'll keep us there till, you know, we no longer exist. Keep the people poor. Keep them fighting each other. Keep them using drugs and alcohol to get over the despair. Keep them down. Genocide. Raphael Lemkin, the human rights lawyer who coined the word genocide, defines genocide as a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups, with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The international community identifies these actions as killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. What we're trying to tell you, America and you American people, you need to get your head out of your ass and really look at what you're doing. The only thing that you can see clear is the misery that you created. That's the only thing you can see clear. You don't see love. You don't see caring. And most of all, this word peace, you don't even know what that means because you never had that either. And the other two, you never had it. If you did, where is it? How does the white man replace my eastern people that once lived in paradise along that eastern shoreline? They're gone. The language is gone. They don't exist anymore. What did you do with them? I am a red man. If the Great Spirit had desired me to be a white man, he would have made me so in the first place. No white man controls our footsteps. If we must die, we die defending our rights. Our nation will never be conquered unless the heartbeats of our women are on the earth. In many ancient traditions, including our own, stories are told not simply to enchant, but to teach. Have you learned from our story? Has it moved you? What will you do now that you know the truth? Let us rise in togetherness from the four directions to hold governments and corporations accountable for the genocide committed against the Lakota people. By ending these atrocities, we can use our own sacred language, culture, and connection with our land to heal our people and to create a future for the generations to come. My language was born here, and it was bred here, and it was raised here, and it's always gonna be here. 
Chump Ho. Why do we call that big tree Chump Ho? Chump Ho is a tree that makes sap. Okay? That's what it does. That's what we call it. Chum means wood. Ho is what comes out. Peji. Peji. No? Peji. Peji. If every household on any reservation continues to use words, or even song, the language grows, and it continues to stay alive. We have this run called the Sacred Hoop Pavado Marun. Uh, we started back in, I believe it was 1983. And that run was started to preserve the way of life on into the future. Last year we took a couple boys that was in old Oglala uh, because they've been, in, they've been always drinking and so now these days when they come on this run, they've been sober for five, for five years now, ever since when they came on this run. I encourage others to learn their language. I mean, especially from like elderly and the older adults. So we're teaching him how to speak Lakota too. And this is his first year. I don't want him to go through the things I go through now. <laughs> All the people that are here, like they want to be here and like, they want to have their prayers heard. The reason I came on this run is because I had like a lot of weight on my, it feels like I have so much pressure on me right now because I live in the res. After this long run, it feels like all this weight's off me. I can just, feels like I started new again. I like making my own music. Hey yo, I wanna hang it up but my spirit says no. Keep what you're doing cause you're on the red road. I'm just another native from the reservation. Born and raised in the third poet's county in the nation. People tell me one thing, I tell them another. I'm proud of myself and I'm proud of my culture. Lakota till I die, repping 605. Never telling lies, always gonna bring surprise. This your native tall T. On the MIC, just another prodigy. Let you know what it be, let you know what I see. Cause I'm just another native from the 605. Trying to live it up, trying to survive. Doing my best with what I had. Cause my res life here, man, it's oh so sad. My people find each other for no specific reason. Drinking a poison, making a noise, and someone ends up bleeding, screaming, yelling, thinking that they hard, passing out, waking up with I used to smoke that weed, I used to drink that drink, but I understand my life is more than what it thinks. I, li I look at my peak and I look at my past, but I look into my future and I hope that it lasts. And that's just a little bit of what I wrote. It's called, it's called Just Another Native. With prayers that honor the past and look to the future, we will never stop asserting our natural right to live as sovereign and free Lakota Oyate on our traditional lands. The progress of why sovereignty exists in Indian country is because that's all we have left. And God damn it, we're gonna fight you, man. As a nation, we have a right to independence and freedom. And right now we are an occupied nation. We want it back to the treaty Back to the treaty, that's the only hope we have. Our last 68 treaty territory, our great-grandparents made it this way because it was the last big territory where we could live with the buffalo and still be a nation. But they have to get out of there. They have to quit occupying it and let us do what we need to do. We want to be free and left alone. But individuals can't have it that way. It takes a nation to administer its full pledge sovereignty. We are the traditional Tichuan Lakota Oyate. We are the grandmothers, the aunties, the elders, the warriors, the freedom fighters, the activists, and the grassroots Oyate. Will you stand with us? Will you help us rise from struggle and be free once again? Who will stand up to the United States to help us? Which nation? in this whole world will stand up to the United States of America and say you have to quit occupying their land. You have to let them live in peace and freedom and independence, just like you said in the treaty, the last treaty, 68 treaty. Who will help us?
gestern mit HGH, Lakota GH, Makawacha, Lena, Wala, Gabna, Nahum, Hetina, Ocheke, Glahana, Shimna, Haish, Skawicha, Shalena, Hom Hetina, Eni Tracha, Hetina, Lakota Kiwoki, Onichila, Nau Hopta, Nau Hom, Nau Gabi. Relatives, we share our humble gratitude for listening to our story as our grandmothers return to their strength. Let us work together now to create a new world for us all. Pilai Mae Itakiape. Okay.